Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you've had a good week so far. Uh, let me real quickly here go over uh, events that are upcoming so that we are all on the same page here before we get going. Um, if things go as planned, this will be our last time to formally assemble as a class. We should be able to uh, complete everything related to the material planning process discussion today. So we will, we will not meet on December 1st. And then, of course, your final exam, which hopefully you have already signed up to take, is on December 8th. So if you have not yet registered for a slot to take your exam, make sure that you do that. But that will be one week from this Thursday. I think there are 105 questions on the test, of which 40 of them are, or roughly 40, we'll say, are a review from the first half of the semester. And then the balance are things that primarily focus on things here from the second half. And that is all that I have by way of announcements. Any questions you guys have about anything? All right, well, that being said, let's go ahead and jump in then in our discussion on material planning. And you will observe as we go through this that a fair amount of this is things that we talked about in conjunction with the production process, but this kind of takes us one step back from the production process as we focus on the planning that precedes the actual production decision. And your book talked about there being a, a set of questions that are, are focused on in material planning, uh, what materials are needed, what quantities are needed, when are they needed. The one question that your book omits that is equally as important as those first three is the where are they needed? Because uh, particularly as we think more and more about globally distributed enterprises or enterprises that have presences across large geographical areas, doesn't do us much good if we have the materials in the right quantity at the right time, but in a different location other than where they are needed. So equally as important as what materials, what quantities, and when are, are where are they needed. And the real challenge here in material planning relates to the economic concept of opportunity costs. Obviously, there are lots of different ways that organizations can make decisions regarding material planning. But if we make the second best decision or the third best decision instead of the best decision, then there's a cost associated with doing that. And so to the extent that we can always make the best decision, we are saving money in our organization. We are positioning ourselves for uh, strategic opportunities and potentially can derive competitive advantage for this, from this. And so a lot of companies look at the material planning process as an area where they can be better than some of the other companies that, that they compete with. So the idea here is what are the costs or risks associated with each of the above questions? Um, doesn't do me much good to have materials other than what I need. Um, if you go into a store and you're looking to purchase a particular product, if they don't have that product, it doesn't do you much good as a consumer if they have an abundance of other things that you don't need. And so we have to have the right materials. And quantities, the challenge there is not only the idea of having too little and, and running out, but also the disadvantage that goes with having an overabundance of things. If we have more than we need, we have to have storage for that. We potentially have to purchase insurance for that, which is unnecessary. We may also run the risk of if we have too many things that ultimately the market may shift and we may be stuck with them and, and no one wants to purchase them. So the idea of, of having the right quantity is a key element of this. And then timing, of course, is very, very key. If we are consistently getting things late, then we are delaying production, we're delaying other things that need to happen in our organization, which could have a variety of, of ripple effects. 
So this is a very complex set of processes that represent a strategic opportunity for a company. One of the things that I uh, generally talk about in, in 3720 when teams are playing the ERP sim game is that typically companies that maximize the productivity of their factory tend to do much better than those companies that have factories with downtimes. Well, magnify that into the real world, and that's even more true. Companies don't want to invest large sums of money in factories that sit unused. There's an opportunity cost associated with that where we could be using those resources to our advantage, and so we want to make sure that we are doing this to the best of our ability, which is why this represents an area that a lot of companies make investment on software, computer programs, other resources to help them plan and optimize their material management processes. And you'll see that uh, APO for Advanced Planning and Optimization is an SAP module that gets a lot of attention. And it's related to what we're talking about here with trying to optimize all of our resource allocations to make sure that we don't have too much, we don't have too little, we don't have it in the wrong place, and get all of that dialed in to the best of our ability. So ultimately, a lot of what we focus on in material planning relates back to demand. We don't buy things just for the sake of buying things. We buy things to sell to customers, to use as components in things that we are manufacturing, to use in our daily operations to accomplish things. And so the demand for materials is actually derived from a variety of other things. If we are a make-to-stock company, we will have sales forecasts that drive our planning process. And so to the extent those sales forecasts are good and accurate, then we can do a good job in, in managing our resources to fulfill those. To the extent that those sales forecasts are problematic, well, now we are making plans on a shaky or errant foundation. If we are a make-to-order company, then it may not be sales forecasts that are driving our planning, but the actual sales that we have made. And so in that case, it becomes a little bit different where now we're looking at actual orders to fulfill and we have to think about how we sequence production, how we plan in order to optimize our ability to fulfill those existing orders. Apart from the thought of make to stock and make to order, we also have things like general production planning, plant maintenance, project planning, all of those can and do create demand for materials as well. And so our focus in materials planning is on these proposals, these different ways that we can fulfill our need for materials in our organization. And so we think in terms of, okay, some of these things we are going to buy so we'll have purchase requisitions representing requests to buy things that will be targeted for external procurement. And then we'll have some things that we'll fulfill by way of our actually making the things, which we could think of as internal procurement. And we handle those with planned orders, uh, which are requests for things to be made. So ultimately what we're going to see here is we have uh, the material planning process and out of that are either going to come these purchase requisitions or these uh, planned orders for us to use as a way of satisfying our demand for materials. So pretty, you know, these are concepts that we have talked about to this point, but just to kind of bring it all together in the context of material planning. This diagram illustrates that. This is from your book, and you'll notice here it talks about, okay, we have uh, a team in our organization that is tasked with operations management. And so 
those would be perhaps plant managers and other people that work on this process for us. I introduced the term APO a moment ago as a part of this, but you're going to have people from sales and, and operations planning. You're going to have demand management that, that factors into this. You're going to have the MRP process that factors into this. So we have operational plans. We have requirements. We have procurement proposals. And ultimately, all of that is designed to equip us to be able to accomplish the production process and for us to be able to successfully accomplish the procurement process of those things that we wish to buy so that we have the inventory to be able to accomplish fulfillment. So material planning kind of recognizes that all of these processes are intermeshed with one another and we have to figure out a way to manage this optimally with, within our organization. So in other processes, we've talked about key organizational data and, and in material planning, we have clients that are relevant, company code relevant for the financial accounting perspective, and then we have plants and storage locations. These two guys right here are the primary focal element of logistics. So as we think of where things are going to be made, where they're going to be delivered, where they're going to be stored, all of that falls into elements related to plant and, and storage locations. Master data, these are all things that we have talked about to this point, bills of material, product routings, product <coughs> groups, material masters come into play. On the material master, MRP and work scheduling views are going to contain important information to drive our material planning. This is plant specific. Uh, we've talked about that before. Obviously, the basic purchasing, sales, and accounting views are, are going to be relevant. But the other element here that's going to be particularly important to us is the procurement type. Are we making this? Are we buying it? Are we doing some of both? There will be some materials that sometimes we buy and sometimes we make. And then, of course, we could have a material master that exists, but the procurement type is none, meaning that the product has been discontinued, but the material master is still in, in our system. So this diagram from your book kind of illustrates all the different things that are on the material master that are important for us in material planning. So you'll notice the MRP1 view tells us the MRP type. We'll talk about that in a moment here. Um, the lot size, reorder points, other things of that sort are there. Uh, MRP3 view shows consumption modes and consumption periods. We'll talk about that in a few moments as well. Work scheduling relates to production. So you can see the MRP views of which there are four uh, different screens that the MRP view is spread across really contains a lot of key information for us in material planning. We will talk about the MRP process in moderate depth here in just a few moments, but be aware it is one of the more technical elements of an ERP system, and so it is something that those who uh, have expertise in this have to devote a lot of study to because companies have a, a lot of alternatives here. You might recall that in ERP SIM when you ran the MRP process you were presented with an initial screen that gave you lots of choices on how to configure the MRP run. That's what we're getting ready to talk about here. We have different types of MRP. MRP material or MRP is material requirement planning. As a part of that, the material production planning technique gives us three different options for how the overall planning can be done here. We can engage in consumption-based planning, material requirements planning, or a master production schedule. So, one of the things that the material master is going to have on it is the material production planning technique. So if we say we want to engage in consumption-based planning, 
Well, this is therefore going to be based on historical consumption, and we're going to have to designate some facts about this material, most notably the reorder point, the safety stock level, and the replenishment lead time. And we'll go through this calculation here in just a moment. So one way that we can plan for materials is through consumption-based planning. Bless you. The second way that we can plan for materials is through the MRP process. The third way that we can plan our materials is through the creation of a master production schedule. So one of the big things for us for today is for you to understand the distinction between those three. So let's start off by talking about consumption-based planning. In consumption-based planning, you'll notice we have three very important things here. We have a reorder point, we have safety stock, and then we have replenishment lead time. And the best way to illustrate the way consumption-based planning will work is, is through a diagram. So let's talk through this for a moment here. Let's, um, let's, let's figure out what this material is. And let's say for the sake of, of argument here, this is something that we buy. And we'll stick with the same thing that you've been doing in your lab work, which is bicycles. And we'll assume that these are tires. So the actual rubber tires that we use when we make a bicycle, we don't make the tires, we buy them and then use them. Safety stock is a measure of comfort that I want to have in making sure that I never ever run out of tires. If my primary job is to make sure that the factory that makes bicycles never goes down, I know that if we ever run out of tires, we have problems. So I need to think about two very important things in thinking about this issue of safety stock. The first is, how long does it take me to get new tires in once I place an order with my vendor? So let's say, for example, that my vendor tells me that if you order on Monday, I'll have it to you on Thursday. If you order on Tuesday, I'll have it for you on Friday. Wednesday, you'll get it on Saturday. Let's assume, for the sake of argument, they deliver six days a week. And so my lead time here is three days in this example. So at any given point in time, I know I can pick up the phone and have more tires here three days in the future. So what I have to make sure is that my safety stock is sufficient so that if all of a sudden we crank the factory up to full capacity and we really, really start kicking out the bicycles, that we will never run out of tires considering that it takes me three days to get them in. So maybe I say something to myself like, all right, when I run the factory at full capacity, they can make this many bikes a day, and it's going to therefore take me three days to get more. And so I come up with a number that I'm comfortable with where I say, I want to set a safety stock of 1,000 tires, which means that I never, ever want to work my inventory down to zero when we are, are at an inventory level at our lowest point, we really want to always have a buffer of 1,000. That way, if something happens and we wind up having to uh, set aside a lot of defective tires or we wind up actually making more than typical, we know that this will cover us and give us a, a level of cushion here. So I now have two very important facts. I have a thousand tires that I know I want to keep on hand as safety stock and I know that it's going to take me three days in order to get new stuff in. The next thing that I look at is, is my consumption, which is illustrated by this line right here. Now, because we're talking about tires, we're talking about tires being issued to the factory for the sake of them using it to make bicycles. And let's assume that my factory can make 2,500 bicycles a day. 
So every bicycle gets two tires. So I know that my consumption here is 5,000 tires per day. So now what I can do is I can begin to formulate a strategy here. For example, if I know that I'm going to be making 5,000, or if I'm going to be using 5,000 tires a day, and I know it's going to take me three days to get new tires in, well, 5,000 times three tells me that in this period right here, this represents 15,000 tires. So if I move that over here, I can see that my reorder point will be when I show an inventory level of 16,000 units, it's, it's time to order more tires. You see that because then if I get more tires in, you know, the three days are going to pass while I'm waiting for the tires to come in. I use up this buffer right here. I have my safety stock that's affording me a little bit of protection here. But ultimately, I've got to order when I hit point B. The other thing for me to look at is how big an order do I need to place? Now, there are lots of different ways that that can be calculated. There are formulas such as EOQ and such that we won't go into here that fundamentally ask the question, how often do you want to place orders? Do you want to order once a week? Do you want to order once a month? Do you want to order, you want to really stock up? How do you want to handle this? But I will make a decision, for example, that every time I order, Maybe I decide that I will place an order for 50,000. So what actually happens here is, is we'll kind of work it from this point forward. I'm sitting here at point A, and my tire order just came in. So I just got in 50,000 more tires. So I should have an inventory right now, actually 51,000 tires, because I've got my 50,000 that just came in plus my safety stock. And what's going to happen now is I'm going to start using these tires at the rate of 5,000 a day until I get to an inventory level of 15,000, which I'll make match up with the diagram here. So when I get to 15,000 as my reorder point, I trigger an order for another 50,000 and then expect those to come in three days later. So what we wind up with over time is our inventory levels look something like this. We have a lot in inventory. We work it down, we work it down, we work it down. But we don't work it down to zero. We have a little bit of safety stock, and then we replenish. And then we work it down, we work it down, we work it down, and then we replenish. That should be a vertical line here. And so we wind up with this, what's often called a sawtooth curve. It's not really a curve, but you get the idea here. It kind of looks like the teeth on a saw that illustrates our inventory working it down and building back up again. Now, let's put this in a context that you could relate to. Your ERP SIM experience. You bought materials using MRP. Let's throw that out, because if we're doing this, we don't do MRP, okay? Instead, what you would do is you would say, okay, let's talk about blueberries. Not blueberry muesli, but blueberries. And we would say something like, okay, we always want to have on hand 1,000 kilograms of blueberries. And we know that once we order blueberries, it's going to take them four days to come in. So we do a calculation based on our use of blueberries in the factory during that period. We come up with the reorder point. And what we do is we tell the system, my safety stock is 1,000. My reorder point is 15,000. My replenishment lead time is whatever it is. And I tell it what vendor this is based on. And then what happens is every day 
the system checks my inventory as it relates to the designated reorder point and orders more if I need it to. So we're not doing planning based on orders coming in from customers. We're not really doing planning based on anything other than our expected consumption of this material. And so this is one way that we could plan materials. I would suggest to you that if you owned a retail store, this would be a very reasonable way for, let's say, Walmart to manage the stock on their shelves. You know, we're coming up to Christmas time, and so they're thinking about teddy bears. And so in their store, they say, you know, we never ever want to run out of teddy bears because teddy bears are, are, are really popular Christmas items. And so no matter what, we always want to make sure that we have at least three teddy bears in stock. So we have a safety stock of three teddy bears. And then they look at, okay, every time we order teddy bears, it takes us a week to get those in. So we have a seven-day replenishment time. And maybe we look back historically and we say, you know, basically we order, we sell about 20 teddy bears a day. So seven-day lead time times 20 teddy bears a day. My reorder point is going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 143. When I get to 143 teddy bears, I know it's time to order more. And let's just say for argument's sake, I, I order in lots of 500. So I just tell the cash register, you know, every time somebody buys something, they scan it. And so the computer just is constantly on lookout and it knows, whoops, we just sold down to 143 teddy bears. Let's send in an order for 500 more. And this is the way that you could manage replenishment of materials. Questions about this? All right, that was way one. Way two, looking at it based on independent or dependent demand. If we talk about independent demand, we are talking about demand for our product from our customers. So demand is based on external demand. So we have two different ways that, that we can, or we can think about this in that regard. We can use this for finished goods or trading goods. What we just worked through a moment ago, consumption-based planning works really great for raw materials. This would be something that we could use for finished goods and trading goods. So we have two choices here. We can calculate independent demand based on actual sales or forecasted sales. So once again, actual sales, this would go with make to order. Forecasted sales, this would go make to stock. So there are two new terms for us to introduce to our vocabulary here, and that is CIRs and PIRs. CIRs are customer independent requirements, which is actual sales to customers. We've already made these. These are like money in the bank to us. We know these are actual sales that have been contracted those are CIRs, those are customer independent requirements. The other alternative would be for us to do some kind of forecasting. Those are requirements for sure, but they're certainly not as firm. So these are called planned independent requirements. Now we can do our planning based solely on CIRs or based solely on PIRs or we can be a little bit sophisticated and we can use both of those in our planning. So the idea here is we have independent demand which is going to be influenced by CIRs and PIRs. Then we have dependent demand, 
which is demand that is derived from our independent demand. So once again, to go back to our ERP SIM experience, independent demand would be a box of blueberry muesli. Dependent demand would be the demand that gets generated for oats and wheat and blueberries and bags and boxes and all the other things that go into making a box of blueberry muesli. So independent demand we will generally focus on finished goods and trading goods. Dependent demand is usually focusing on semi-finished goods and raw materials because those are the things that are used to make the items that will ultimately settle and satisfy the independent demand. questions. All right, here's the, the next couple of slides will be the most potentially confusing things that we talk about today. So put your thinking caps on for a few more minutes here and then after that I think it will be downhill. We can come up with a strategy that includes both PIRs and CIRs. When we do this, the CIRs consume the PIRs. They are not added together. Now, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about, and I'll put this on the whiteboard for the sake of space. All right, it's almost the beginning of December. So let's assume that we have done some planning for December of 2016. And we put together a plan. Our planned independent requirements were that in the month of December, we're expecting to sell 20,000, we'll, we'll stick with our teddy bear example. We're expecting to sell 20,000 teddy bears in the month of December. So that is a planned independent requirement. Planned meaning we just planned it. It's, it's a forecast. We have in hand orders from customers, customer independent requirements for 2,000 teddy bears. Okay? They could like reserve them on our website and then come by and pick them up. So we look at this situation and we're using this just for the sake of planning acquisition of materials and such. When a strategy includes both PIRs and CIRs, the CIRs consume the PIRs. So look at this way. I'm expecting to sell 20,000 teddy bears in December and I've already sold 2,000 of them. So I, I trust you can see that I, I'm, I'm in really good. I'm a really good situation here. I mean, I'm planning to sell 20,000. I have orders on hand already for 2,000, which you could think of this way. I still have 18,000 more I can sell, and I, I don't have a problem at this point. So we can put together a strategy that involves both PIRs and CIRs. And when we do that, the way we view it as the customer independent requirements will consume part of what we have planned here. Here's a table from your, from your book. So example one, we put together a plan that said we're going to need 50. We have customer orders on hand for 60. Well, you look at that and you say, wow, we underestimate it. So what's actually going to happen here is we're going to just focus on satisfying these 60 orders right here, and, and we don't have any excess here. We used up all 50 of these in satisfying these orders, and we had to get 10 more from someplace else. Scenario number two, example two, is we planned to sell 50, 
and we have customer order in hand right now for 40. Okay, no problem there. We'll, we'll make our 50. We'll use 40 of those to satisfy the customer independent requirements. And then we will have 10 left over to satisfy other orders that are, are due and coming in. So as we think about planning, and this is where this gets kind of weird, we can think in terms of forward planning, backward planning, or half and half planning. These are represented by different planning. They're called planning modes. Planning mode one, we look backward. Okay, so let's try and make sense of this diagram right here. You notice as we go from left to right, that's time passing. So we'll assume this is month one, this is month two, this is month three, this is month four. And, and we are sitting right here. So as of today, we have 60 customer independent requirements. And so we're going to satisfy this through backward planning. And we're going to say, OK, we have 60 orders from customers. We have 40 items left from last month that were part of our planning. And so we'll use that to satisfy this. And then we'll take 20 more from here. Actually, let me back up a little bit. To, I think we'll make this easier. Here we are right here. This is today. So we look into the future, and we see that between month two and month three, we have orders we have to fulfill for 60 items. So we can say, OK, there's no problem. Uh, two months from now, we'll make 40 units. And that'll give us 40 to devote to this. And this month, we'll make 40 units. And we'll, we'll keep 20 of those around. So this 20 plus this 40 will satisfy this 60. So we still have 20 planned items that are unspoken for at this point. But we can satisfy this demand for customer independent requirements by building up our inventory in month one and month two as you see reflected there by the bars. That's backwards consumption planning. And at this point, we're pretty good because it looks like we have the ability to make 40 units a month. And so if we make 40 units a month, as shown here, we can satisfy, in fact, all of that customer demand. Scenario two, we don't do it that way. We think in terms of forward planning. This is, notice this one, this is mode one planning. Mode one planning is backward planning. Mode three planning, we think in terms of moving forward, meaning that at this point in time, we have 60 customer orders that have come in, and we always focus on satisfying that with future production. So we're still going to plan on making 40 items a month, maybe because that's all we can make in our factory. And so this month right here, we'll take care of 40 of those units. And then we move to the next month. And we're going to take 20 of those and use that to satisfy customer independent requirements. And then we'll have 20 left over that we can use to satisfy other orders that might come in after that block of 60. So the idea here is that do we think in terms of trying to satisfy customer demand with things we've already made, that's mode one planning, or with things we will make in the future, that's mode three planning. The other mode is, confusingly enough, called mode two slash four. Mode two slash four says that we work backwards and forwards, and we kind of bounce back and forth in that fashion. So here's my 60 that I still need. I look backwards, and I say, oh, look, 
I can grab 40 from back there and use that to fulfill that order. And then I look forward and I say, oh, look, I can grab 20 from there. And so I can satisfy this particular block of customer orders by pulling some from past production and slotting some into future production. So when you are doing material planning and you are configuring your planning run, you pick which planning mode you want the system to use. Do you want it just to look backwards? Do you want it just to look forward? Or do you want it to look backwards and forwards until it can find the items that are needed to actually satisfy your customer independent requirements? Questions? Yes, ma'am. There may be a question about that. I, I don't recall definitively. But as long as you remember one is backwards, three is forward, and two four is back and forward, you're, you should be OK. The two four should be pretty easy to remember because it's you know two numbers and so backward, forward. So you really just have to remember mode one is backwards and mode three is forward. Other questions? Up here, yes. Well, in my diagram, they could be weeks. They could actually be days. They're just, it's just showing the passage of time. If you were to do backwards consumption, and it's hard to really know your CRRs at the time, right? In month one when you're... Yeah. Well, it depends. I mean, sometimes people order a boat, and they don't want it delivered for six months. You know, so this is going to depend on... Yes, this is how we're, we're, we're going to manage those kinds of commitments. Yeah, if you were in mode one, then at that point you would have to say, oh no, I, I can't satisfy these, what am I going to do? And at that point you might look at bringing on additional manufacturing capability, subcontracting out some of the work. That's exactly why you would do this. And that's the idea is, you're pairing your forecast with the actual demand for things. So you're thinking, if I make 40 units a month, I'm going to be good, or 40 units a week, I'm going to be good. And this basically gives you a way of saying, yes, I am going to be good, or no, that's going to cause a problem for me. But ultimately, all three of these show that we can fulfill the customer order at some point here without it being problematic. And that right there is a key element of just ERP in general, is companies that have been in existence for a while should have lots of information at their disposal, which should give them an advantage over their competitors. Now, are they really using it that way? Who knows? But it's kind of like if you were trying to create an online store to compete with Amazon, you might undercut them on prices, hypothetically, but you're not going to have all the expertise that they should have about what customers buy, when they buy it, uh, trends in the industry, and things like that. So yeah, this is a situation where the more we can bring historical information to bear, the better our planning is going to be. Good observation. OK, so we've talked about consumption-based planning. We've talked about CIRs and PIRs. That leaves two things on the table, MRP and MPS. Well, we've talked a little bit about MRP a lot this semester. So let's fill in just a couple more things here. MRP stands for Materials Requirement Planning. And it derives dependent requirements from independent requirements. We put in sales forecasts which we now know we can more properly call customer independent requirements or planned independent requirements. We put that into the system, and the system is going to evaluate that and figure out what dependent materials we need through a process commonly called bomb explosion, where it goes through 
and it looks at the bills of material for each of the items. It does the calculation because all bombs are single level in SAP ERP. It may have to iterate through a set of bombs because bomb one might make reference to two or three materials which have their own bill of materials and so on and so on and so on. So the MRP process is going to iterate through all of this and figure out the definitive calculation of everything that, that we might actually need. And so if we, if we look at that in terms of this right here, we have a forecast that we put into the system for a finished good. We need 10,000 bicycles. Well, it looks at the bill of materials for those bicycles, and it sees that those bicycles are made up of semi-finished good one, semi-finished good two, and raw material one. So for semi-finished goods one, it has a bill of material. So it explodes that bill of material, and it sees that it references semi-finished goods, I guess this would be three, and raw material R2. So it explodes this one, and now we're down to just everything being raw materials. But the point is that what MRP will do is it will start with you giving it the independent requirement, and then it will do as much bomb explosion as is needed to fill out this entire tree with a definitive calculation. That is what MRP does. And I have referenced this before, but one reason why MRP is challenging in some organizations is because this can take a lot of time for the system to calculate. I went to a presentation one time for Steelcase and they said that they typically, that their overall catalog of products is over a million units, over a million rather different products. So you can imagine the system having to go through and do these calculations for a million different products where they're having to do bomb explosions and everything else. This can take hours for the system to run, if not longer than a day in some instances. But this is a very common technique that a lot of companies use. So just to pause here for a second, I can plan material acquisition through consumption-based planning. Consumption-based planning was the thing that gave us that sawtooth curve. I just think in terms of reorder points and safety stock and consumption lines, and I just, I just plan accordingly. This is a way of doing a much more precise calculation. I have a third alternative that will probably strike you as very weird. It is called the master production scheduling method of approach. How is the master production schedule different than MRP? And I'm going to go to this slide and then back up. We said that with MRP, we start with the finished good, we explode to first level bombs, then we explode and we explode and we keep exploding until there's nothing else left to explode. That's the way MRP works. MPS starts with the finished goods, does one level of explosion, and it's done. It stops. It does not explode any further down. It just does a one level explosion. Now you might think, what good is that? Because it now, it's, it's, you know, in this scenario right here, it's told me I need this many semi-finished goods and this many semi-finished goods, but it hasn't gathered the materials that I need to make those. So this doesn't seem like it would be a very, very useful solution for me. It's kind of like working half of a math problem and then stopping. Well, in fact, that's the way that master production scheduling MPS works. It derives dependent requirements only for the first level component in the bomb. So it does one bomb explosion for the item that we have the independent requirements for. So what will happen in a lot of companies is this they will run 
master production scheduling for certain items and then for other items they'll do full MRP runs. So what might actually happen here is we might do an MPS run and then for some items go back in and have the system do a full MRP run. Now let me back up or actually go forward and explain what I'm talking about here. Look at this scenario right here. So let's assume, you know, here's our finished good and, and let's focus on this branch of the tree right here. To make this semi-finished goods, this semi-finished good right here, you'll notice we need another semi-finished good and a raw material. Well, all together you can see that there are three raw materials that come into play. Suppose my strategy is this. This raw material right here and this raw material right here, they're all really, really common stuff. So I'm just going to do consumption-based planning for these things. This is back to my, my sawtooth curve. I'm just going to plan those raw materials through consumption-based planning. So if I do consumption-based planning on these guys, I don't need MRP to tell me how much to order because I'm going to be handling my inventory levels apart from that calculation anyhow. So as a way of saving time, I have just the first level explosion so I know what I have to take care of making in order to be able to fulfill that finished good. And I can check my inventory levels and plans for those things, but I'm not going to bother having the computer come down and tell me that, oh yeah, for this teddy bear, you need 0.5 ounces of stuffing per teddy bear because I buy stuffing by the ton and I just reorder it when I'm down to 500 pounds, okay? So there's no sense in me figuring out that I need exactly 542.38 pounds of stuffing because I don't order it that way, okay? And this right here is teddy bear skin fabric, okay? I just order that, you know, in huge rolls. So I don't need this production run to tell me that I need 427 feet of teddy bear fur because I order it in the huge rolls and so I just plan that through consumption-based planning. So the point of this is depending upon how I want to plan things, if I want to have the system iterate through and do a very precise calculation of my needs, I can do that. The system can do that and that's what MRP is for. But if I only want it to do what's often just called a rough cut, if I wanted to do a rough cut so that, you know, maybe in my really silly example here, uh, this semi-finished good right here is, is teddy bear heads, okay? Maybe we make the teddy bear heads and then we attach it to the torso. And so I know that next month I'm going to need 10,000 teddy bear heads. Well, that's not a problem. You know, I can look at that right off and say, oh yeah, we can fulfill that. We've got plenty of raw materials to make the teddy bear heads. So there's no sense in having the system waste its time doing a very precise calculation because I can look at that and say, I can handle that without issue. So it is not unusual for companies to employ a strategy that will have them do some MRP and some MPS. And so, as it says here, a lot of times what we'll do is we might even do daily MPS calculations for critical items just to make sure as a double check that we're going to have the resources that we need so we can check it against inventory levels. And then less frequently, we might do a full MRP run if we're going to go that strategy. So remember, the, the big picture here is, when it comes to material planning, I can either use consumption-based planning, which means that I don't worry about actual things like this. I just replenish up to a certain stock level and call it good. Or I can do the fully detailed MRP-based planning, or I kind of have this hybrid 
that allows me to sort of use MRP type planning, but to pair it with consumption-based planning for raw materials, and that's the master production schedule alternative. But the key distinction here is MPS explodes one level. MRP does the full explosion all the way down. This slide right here from your book is just another way of showing this, that MRP, multi-level planning, goes all the way down, whereas MPS, single level, so it basically does MRP, but just for one level. Questions about that? Okay, so one other term that I think we've used, but just for the sake of making sure we have it in our vocabulary, lot size comes into play here. This is thinking in terms of quantities that we handle as one bundle. You know, I use teddy bears as an example. Maybe we really don't make one teddy bear at a time. We always will make teddy bears in batches of, of 20. And so that would be the lot size. We think in terms of lot sizes of 20. The idea here is um, when we're thinking about doing the calculation. So let's say that I always think in terms of making teddy bears in lots of 20. And I just did a calculation, and it said that I need to make 27 teddy bears. So how do I do this? Well, if I do lot for lot, I will do a batch of 20, and then I'll do a batch of 7 in order to accommodate that. The other alternative is I need 27. I do a batch of 20, and I do another batch of 20. I always will bounce up to the lot size there. So that's just an item that we can set on the material master for a material to determine how the system will actually manage that. Questions? Okay, I'm going to skip over a couple slides because we really have, or I guess one slide there because we don't really need to talk about it. So let's talk about how this, how what we've been talking about plays out in an organization. How often do companies go through this? You know, how often do they sit down and do all these calculations? Um, and really the answer to that is it depends on how often you want to update your production plan. You know, if you want to schedule the factory a month in advance, then you certainly don't need to be doing these calculations every day. You could think in terms of doing them every two weeks and updating your plan accordingly. Or you could do these calculations daily if you're running some kind of just-in-time manufacturing. So really, there, there's no hard and fast rule here this planning is done whenever a company wants to revise its plans. It is typically realized, though, that you might do a rough plan even a year in advance. You might say, okay, next year we expect to sell 2.5 million teddy bears. But then something happened. You know, over Christmas, I don't know, Oprah had a special, and she talked about how wonderful teddy bears are, and so now, instead of expecting to sell 2 million, we're expecting to sell 75 million, okay? Um, stuff like that happens. So it is not unusual, it's very typical for companies to do a lot of environmental scanning, looking for things that might cause them to need to redo their forecast. So even if we do say, all right, we're only going to do this once a month or something like that, we always need to be open for unexpected events. We can also generate different plans. You know, we could, we could think about, okay, we're getting ready to go into 2017. And 
let's say we have scenario A, B, and C. And let's say scenario B is what we think is most likely to happen, which is that we'll sell 2.5 million teddy bears. Well, scenario A is if for some reason people don't like buying teddy bears anymore, maybe like there's a mass murderer who pops up and his name is Ted E. Bear, and so no one wants to buy teddy bears anymore. And so in this scenario, um, you know, we're only going to sell 500,000. Or scenario C is like if it's a really, really great year and, and we're going to expect to sell 10 million. Well, it would not at all be unusual in an organization for them to run scenario A, B, and C to see what they look like in terms of revenue, in terms of material needs, so that they might say, for example, okay, wow, if scenario C happens, we're going to need a lot more foam than we've ever bought before. Can we find another supplier of foam that can help us fulfill supplemental demand if we find that we really need to make that many teddy bears? So we can do a lot of uh, assumption-based planning and look at different scenarios. And my suggestion to you is that in large organizations, they're absolutely going to look at that and they're going to game this out different ways and simulate different scenarios and see how it impacts the company overall. So companies will sit down and they'll typically start with creating a sales plan. So you don't start out by saying, how many teddy bears do we expect to make? You look at it from the other perspective. You always start with your sales and work your way backwards. And so the idea is the better those sales forecasts can be, the better everything else that's based on them is going to be, which goes back to the observation before. If we can bring analytics to bear here and we can really dial in that number better than our competitors, we can position ourselves to run our manufacturing more efficiently, to manage our procurement more efficiently, and put ourselves overall in a much better environment. So we start with the sales plan, and then from the sales plan, we're going to back into our inventory requirements based on calculations and based on our assessment of demand, then at that point, we're going to look at our actual operations plans, our production plans, and so on. So imagine that you're in charge of planning for Nissan Automotive. One of the things you would look at is, okay, how many cars overall do we expect to sell next year? And then once you have that, it's like, okay, how many of those are going to be pickup trucks? How many of those are going to be hybrids? How many of those are going to be electric cars? And so we start with a big picture, and then we progressively refine it. And maybe we come to the conclusion that we're going to have a lot more demand for hybrids next year. So we need to convert one of our factories from making typical gas combustion cars to hybrid. And so we go about the process of retooling the factory. But all of that is going to be derived from our sales forecast numbers. And we do a lot of you know, looking at feasibility. And we might say, OK, conservatively speaking, we think we'll sell at least 5 million cars because we've sold 5 million cars at minimum every year for the last, I don't know, 25 years. But then we say, you know, beyond that, we could sell as few as 5 million or we could sell as many as 50 million. And we look at different plans and we study feasibility. And so that's the idea here behind this. And this is obviously not a screenshot, it's an illustration, but it's something that should look familiar to you from some of the lab work that you have done here. And, and you just did one plan, but the idea was that you could have gone in and you could have done a plan that you would think would be conservative, and then you could do a plan that was a little bit more optimistic, and you could have multiple versions of plans and the idea being that, okay, then we start into 2017 and we see how January's going. And based on how January's going, we adjust our plan for the last six months in the year and so on. So the system is obviously, it's configured here to allow us to evaluate a variety of, of different scenarios here. And, and this right here just illustrates what we've talked about before, which is 
And all of this, we look at, okay, here's when we have to have it, and we rely on the system to help us back up the calculation of our actual needed items, the calculation of time frames, and so on, and putting together an actual production schedule. When you run MRP, going back to remember on the MRP screen you had all those different choices, there are lots of different what are called processing keys that you could pick. We're not going to talk about all of them, but just as an example, there's NetPull, Netch, and Nupal. For ERP SIM, we used Nupal. Nupal says, I just put in a new plan. Throw away the old plan. It's null and void. It has no relevance here anymore. Pretend like it never existed. Recalculate everything from the ground up. That's Nupal. That's regenerative planning. We're going to start over again. But you can run MRP and tell it not to act that way. You can run MRP and say, okay, look, I have given you a forecast. And imagine, think about your MRP grid. And we only ever put numbers in one column. But every one of those columns was a different month. So imagine you put in a whole year's worth of forecasts. But now you're going in and you're saying, okay, we've loaded in a whole year's worth of forecast, but don't recalculate the whole year. We don't want to do that. But we do want to know what our immediate needs are. So just look at the next 30 days. And so we specify a planning horizon. And we say to it, just look at that planning horizon and only look at the things that I have changed that are changes in the next 30 days. You know, there might have been a plan in there, and I went in and updated the whole year. But I'm telling you, don't look at the whole year. Just look at the next 30 days and redo the calculations for that particular period. So I'm clamping down the, the planning horizon. So the whole set of data is in there, but I'm telling you, just redo calculations in, in that particular region. The other alternative is to tell it, okay, this right here, net pull, I'm, I'm focusing on time in clamping down the planning horizon. In Netch, I'm focusing on materials. And so I'm telling it, look, I went in and changed the plan. But if you look at it, of the 150,000 items we sell, I only changed eight. So don't redo the calculation for the whole 150,000. Just redo the calculation for those eight. Okay? So the idea here is Nupal throws away everything, redoes the whole calculation. NetPull says, no, 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 just redo the calculation for this particular time horizon. Netch says, okay, redo the whole horizon, redo the total horizon, but only do it for the materials that I've actually made changes to in the MRP process. So the point of this is, and I began by saying this is not exhaustive, but the idea here is you can control how the MRP calculation is done. This is one way that you can control it, is through setting the processing key. The other control you have is, what does the MRP process output? Now, we can tell it if we say choice one for purchase requisition. It will create purchase requisitions for us. And you're used to the fact that when in ERP SIM, whenever you ran MRP, it created purchase requisitions. So you're used to that. We can tell it to create planned orders. You're also used to it doing that. But the point of this is you could tell it to create purchase requisitions, but not planned orders. You could create planned orders manually. 
You could, if you wanted to, tell it to create planned orders and not create purchase requisitions. Not sure why you'd want to do that, but you could. Or you can tell it things like create purchase requisitions only for the next two months. And then we'll run you again a month from now and you can create them for the next two months. You know, the idea is, do I really want the system to waste its time generating purchase requisitions for November of 2017, given that it's currently November 2016? You know, I'm gonna load in all my sales forecasts, but I really don't need purchase requisitions that far in advance. So I can control what actually gets output by, by the MRP process. So, you know, here, here's the idea, um, a diagram from your book where you, you have a material and it's, it's going to look at and say, okay, we're going to need to do some external procurement. And so it generates purchase requisitions, puts schedule lines to show dates when things are going to need to be delivered, lets you convert those to purchase orders. You know, this is the whole MRP process that you are very used to from your work with ERP SIM. I have one last slide and then we'll back up. I'm trying to make sure we get all of this in. MRP, you can execute MRP for one plant, you can execute MRP for multiple plants, or you can create what are called MRP areas, which are basically pre-designed segments of blocks of plants that you always plan together. We have not talked about financial accounting. That's because there are no financial accounting implications in anything that we've talked about here, and there's no material movements. So all of the documents that we're generating here are planning documents, and they're the ones that we've talked about, like purchase requisitions and planned orders and schedules and things of that sort. So there's no implications beyond the overall planning process itself. Now I had to go pretty quickly because I wanted to get all of this in today and we do have a couple minutes. I don't know if there's any slides I need to back up to or any questions you guys have, but now is the time to ask them. Yes, sir. Back up one more, this guy right here. Okay. Other, yes ma'am. We could, but I don't have any new questions. Um, we can, if, if you guys want, if, if enough people would plan on coming, um, we can get together on Thursday and I can review things if you guys have questions. Some semesters the class has just said, we want to get together on our own and they just use it as a study time on their own. So, um, what would you guys like to do? Okay, I just, I mean, everybody's sitting there like, I don't know, it's last week of class, don't ask me any questions. <laughs> no one wants to commit to anything. It's like, if it's not on the final, I'm not answering any questions right now. You know, check back in a month. So, I, I guess what I will say is, if you guys have any questions, um, let me know. You're, you're welcome to, I, I'll be in my office on Thursday um, during our normal class time and before and after, and I'm happy to go through things with you individually. So come by and, and we can talk through it. Um, your final will look just like your midterm, but with questions on the new things that we have covered. So plan your preparation accordingly. I think I've said this at least a dozen times, but I'll say it again. Go back through and make sure you know the financial accounting transactions. I promise you that's, that's in the neighborhood of 20 to 25 percent of the final is going to be things that relate to that. So if you know those cold, uh, you're going to fare very well, I would think. Questions, requests, all right, so make sure you sign in. Congratulations on finishing things up. Hopefully everyone will do well on the final. And I will look forward to seeing some of you next semester, perhaps, in classes.